Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel, love laser or CNC, make sure you hit that subscribe button down in the corner to get all the latest tips, tricks, tutorials and reviews. Now in today's episode we are building this monster of a machine, the Yora Home Silverback. Now we can see straight away I've had to bridge the gap between two workbenches in order to build this, so it is going to be a big one. But let's start with the basics, get everything unpacked and check it against the content list. So with everything unpacked and laid out, I cannot stress the next two points enough. First is take the packaging list within the manual itself, go through it and double check you have everything that you are supposed to have. You don't want to get halfway through this and find you have a part missing or a bolt missing because it will be a pain to try and deal with. The next thing is take the Allen keys and the spanners that come with the machine and just go around and check all the various nuts and bolts on the machine. Make sure they are tight. This may sound like a lot of work, but it is easier to do it now than to find out later on something is loose or not quite aligning up right, and that is the ultimate cause. Especially some of the smaller bolts on like the Z assembly, where these will be difficult to get to later once the machine has been assembled. So as I say, just go around and double check everything, make sure all the bolts are pinched up. So everything is checked, there was no loose bolts, so I'm really happy with that, and we can now start assembling. Now for the purpose of today, we are going to be going through the instruction manual, page by page and following that. If there is anything that I think can be done in a better order, I will point that out as we go along. Now before we actually get started, I'm just going to mention Loctite. This is kind of like a soft glue for bolts. You don't have to use it, but it can be beneficial to hold everything in place. Obviously these machines can vibrate a bit when they are operating and some bolts can come loose. So one or two drops of this on every bolt when you're putting it together can just ensure everything stays solid and in place. You won't see me using it on today's video because it can get messy if I need to reshoot a particular section, but it is something to consider and is fairly cheap off places like Amazon. So with that out of the way, let's start assembling. So we have laid the frame out, the two Y axis with the front and back joining supports. Now, as you're looking at the machine, you will want the Y1 on your left and the Y2 on your right, with the motors furthest away and also the exposed lead screws on the outside edge. This is very important. Now, what we're going to do is use the M5 20 millimeter bolts along with the M5 spring washers. It will take 16 sets of everything to put this together. There are four on each corner. Now don't tighten these up too much, but you do just want to tighten it up enough to pull everything together. You'll want to use a 20 millimeter M5 bolt with a spring washer and a flat washer placed on with the spring washer first and then the flat washer second. When putting the bolts in, you'll want to make sure the extrusion lines up with the end of the plate. Put the bolts in and tighten them up just till they start to pinch slightly. So with all 16 bolts in place but not tightened up, what we need to do is ensure the frame is perfectly square. Now there are a couple of ways to do this. You can try something like a speed square but I do not recommend these. They are rarely accurate enough for what we need to do on this machine. So put that to the side. Now I do have a calibrated square here that is accurate. So I can get a rough idea by putting this into each corner. However, the simplest and probably the fastest method is to just take a tape measure, go from corner to corner on the frame, and we have 1194, and then we go the other way, corner to corner again, 1194. Perfect, so that does mean the frame is square. If your measurements are slightly different, it means something is a little bit out. So you just release some of those bolts and adjust the frame until you get both of those measurements exactly the same. That then means your frame is square and you can go around and tighten all 16 of those bolts up to ensure everything is held in place. So with all 16 bolts tightened up, do just double check the squareness of the frame, measure corner to corner again. I know I'm really stressing this point, but if later on you go to run your machine and something starts jamming or isn't as smooth as it should be, most common cause is this, the frame not being square. So double check it, triple check it before you move on. Now at the next stage, we are going to install the supports for the bed itself. You have three of these. Start by placing the one at dead center. You can judge this by the holes of the frame and place it in the middle. Now in the instructions, your home suggests putting the two outer ones pretty much the far edge. Now, I don't think that's a good idea. I'd rather bring them in 
in slightly just give yourself a couple of inches on either side the reason for this these machines rarely machine to the very edge of the bed itself anyway so by bringing them in a little bit we're giving the maximum support to the actual working area of the machine now to do this there is a separate pack of corner brackets m5 8 millimeter bolts and the hammerhead um, screws that go into the threaded into the extrusion itself so with these brackets what i would suggest doing is putting the bolt and the nut in first put the nut on give it a couple of turns just to make sure it is gripping then you can put one in place it just slides straight into the extrusion you can try and put the other one in place as well for ease roughly hold it there then obviously bring in your allen key and then do the same on the other side as well as it starts to grip you can then put it in the exact position that you want make sure everything is sitting flush between the extrusion and the bracket itself once you're happy with the position pinch it up to hold it in place once your first bracket is in place then go ahead and do the second bracket behind it put it back in position pinch the bolts up and make sure everything is secure then once you've done that one move to the other end put them in obviously it takes four corners to do each one and once all are in position you'll then have your three supports in place. So with the supports in place, the next thing to do is put the bed in place. Now there are holes already pre-drilled into the extrusion along the front and the back. The spoil board isn't quite symmetrical. You will notice that one end has a bigger gap, whereas the front end has more holes in it. The end with the gap goes at the back of the machine. So place the spoil board in position, make sure the slotted holes align with the holes in the frame, and then use the M520 bolts to drop in and hold it in position. Next, we take the largest of the drag chain brackets and we're gonna put two M5 bolts through with the square T-nut heads. Now again, like we did with the hammerhead nuts, we put them on a couple of turns and then we're gonna put them just below this Y1 motor on the inside of the frame. So you slide the square nut into the extrusion, put it in position and then pinch up the bolts. So next we're getting ready to install the x-axis gantry now in order to do this we need both of these carriages to be parallel with each other the easiest way to do this is to take something like a solid object place it across the plate and then adjust the motor until it comes in to touch that piece of material so now we know that is a set distance from the plate and we will do the same on the other side so now we know those are both parallel, we can get ready to put the x-axis gantry in place. So we've just roughly put the x-axis in place for now. What we're going to need to hold this onto the carriage is some M5 14mm bolt. Now in the instructions it does say M16 on the first page, this is a typo, it's the 14mm ones you need. You'll also need flat washers along with a spring washer. So the first thing that we will do is take the gantry itself pick it up and place it on one end, making sure not to catch the cable. And then push a bit of pressure just to push it over the carriage and it should drop into place nice and easy. Lower it down and it will rest on these side panels which help keep it in position. So with that in place, what we can now do is get the bolts and we can put a flat washer, sorry, we can put a spring washer on first then a flat washer and then we can start to put them in place on the holes on the side making sure the holes are aligned with the holes in the carriages itself just push the plate back slightly until you start to feel the nut go into the hole and then just give it a few turns to get that in place with one in place we'll go around and just put all the others in just to finger tight tension so with the gantry in place we're now just going to go around use the allen key and make sure everything is tightened up to secure it in place Next, we're going to take one of the smaller drag chain brackets and we're going to attach it to the side plate where the X-axis motor sits. There are two pre-drilled holes. We will need the M4 8mm bolts for this. They simply go through the holes and attach to the plate sideways. So the next two jobs we're going to do together, we're going to install the drag chain support rail. This sits on the back of the X-axis on the two brackets attached to each side of the plate. We're also going to attach the drag chain support bracket. This sits on the back of the X-axis gantry, the carriage, sorry, and again, fixes in position there to allow the drag chain to move back and forth. We're going to be using the M5 6mm bolts for this to fix it in place. 
So next we are going to be installing the Z assembly. Now there are four holes in the back of this so make sure your Z carriage is somewhere in between and you can access all four holes. To be fitting this we will be using M5 25mm countersunk bolts. Now we'll switch over to the other camera so you can see what I'm doing. Now what I would suggest doing is obviously just bring one in at a time and make sure you get it in place. Get it aligned with the hole. This can be a little bit fiddly, especially doing it from this side of the camera. Once you get it in, make sure you give it a few turns so that the bolt actually does grip in. Then bring in your second bolt and get that one in position. And again, make sure it's got a couple of turns on it to hold it in place. And then continue with the third and the fourth ones. Once you have all four in, that's when you can then start to tighten them up, but don't pinch any of them up, as I say, until you've got all four in, because you may need that little bit of play in the Z assembly to get this part done. Now, obviously, because we can't get right in there to tighten these up, you've got to do it with the long length of the key. So do get it in there, make sure it's in place, and just put as much pressure on as you can to tighten it. You don't want to over tighten them anyway, but as I say, you do want to make sure that this is secured in place. Next, we're going to be installing the spindle holder. Now, we're going to be doing this with M5 14mm bolts, and I'll switch back over to the other camera to do this. So you place the bolts through the hole, and as we can see on the carriage, we've got holes pre-drilled for them to go into. So similar to mounting the Z-axis, just get one in there. You can always then bring another bolt in by hand, just place that in and give it a couple of turns to position it if you're struggling to hold everything in place with only having two hands. Once it starts to bite, you can then continue and do the other two. Now at this stage, I'm going to bring in my combination square. What you want to do is actually just check that this is as perpendicular with the bed as possible. So go around with your square and check the different sides, check the inside. And I've left a little bit of play in this as we can see here. So then just as you're pinching the bolts up, make sure everything is square and perpendicular with the bed itself. So that's looking pretty good there. I'm going to start to pinch these up just a little bit to hold it in place and hopefully it doesn't move. And then just to be sure, I'm going to check the other side as well. That's looking pretty good. I'm going to check it from the front as well. Now we can see, I don't know if the camera can pick that up. I'll try and move it around slightly. Hopefully the camera can just about see that. What we've got going on here is it's touching on the square on the bottom, but there is a gap at the top, suggesting this is leaning back slightly. Now we can correct this later on when we put the spindle in just to be safe. It may simply just be that as we clamp this up, everything levels out. But you may want to consider pulling this as square as possible. You can release the top two bolts and just put a shim somewhere in the back of it to try and pull it as square as possible. Next, we are installing the wiring loom and the drag chain for this machine. Now it can seem a bit fiddly because it flops all over the place as you're trying to do it. So what I suggest doing is laying it out where it should sit in a loose position. The U-bend on the left hand side should be facing towards the front with the open connection sitting towards the back on the Y motor. And then we're going to use the M4 6mm countersunk bolts to put this in place. Do be very delicate with these, they have fine threads on them. And you also need to be careful around the holes where they connect to the brackets. Obviously you have wires there, so just make sure you move everything out the way as you are putting them in. Now with all the drag chain in place, we're gonna go around and connect all the wiring loom. Now, we're gonna start at the top and work our way back to the end of the drag chain. If you find that the wires sticking out are not long enough to reach to the terminals that you need, Go to the other end of the drag chain and just feed the cable in towards it. You can then pull it through and it will give you that extra length that is required to make sure the connectors can all reach to where they need to go. All the connectors are labelled up, they're male and female connectors and they only go in together one way. So just keep an eye on that, bring them over, push them in until they click and then that is that connector done. So we'll go around and connect all the rest up now. Cable tidy clips are also provided. You just peel the sticky back off them, place them in position and then clip the cable in place. Next, we are going to install the spindle. For this, you will need the 52 millimeter insert to go into the spindle holder. So we're gonna drop that in place. If it's not fitting, make sure the two bolts down the side have been released. Then we're going to simply drop the spindle inside of that, hold it in position and then use your Allen key to tighten the two clamping bolts up on the right hand side. 
So I'm just gonna cut in and interrupt the video there. I got a bit further into doing some tests later on. And what I actually realized is the spindle needs to be as low as possible in the holder. So drop it all the way down until it hits the terminals on either side and then pinch it up. It just allows the collet and the bit to be a bit closer to the bed. Remember to alternate between the top and the bottom. Pinch one up, then go back to the other one and then come back to the original one you started with. Each time you tension one up, it will release a bit of pressure off the other one, so it's good to just keep pinching them in. Now, the reason these need to be tight is to stop the spindle from sliding up and down when you are machining. And last, we connect the cables up. It is blue to the negative and red to the positive. In this case, it is blue on the left and the red on the right. Obviously, the terminals are marked up on the top plates. So obviously, for the purpose of this video, I've just installed the standard spindle that comes with the machine. If you are looking to install something like a Makita router, check out the link in the corner to a previous video I've done about how to wire this all up correctly. Now, that is essentially everything for the physical build of the machine. The last thing really that we've got to do just to finish this off is to plug everything into the control box. So let's take a closer look at that now. Now, when it comes to the control box, every cable is labeled up. So here we have X limit. We can see just underneath here, it says X limit. There is a slight notch in the aviation connector. So push that in, make sure it is sitting comfortably and then thread this on until it is tight and locked in position. Once that is held in, the connection is secure and we can move on and do the rest. So with all the main cables in place, we're going to connect the Z probe. This just goes underneath here. Similar process again, just push it in and thread it on until it is tight. We're also then going to connect the USB cable, plug that in and make sure the other end of the blue lead is plugged into your PC or laptop. Take the power cable as well, plug that in. Make sure everything is tight and secure. We've got a little switch down here to go between laser and spindle. Make sure that is set to spindle. Plug your power cord into the wall, turn the machine on, and then we'll move over to the PC to finish the setup off. Now you're at your PC and laptop, and what we're about to do is allow your PC to talk to your CNC machines, but there are three things you need to do before we move on. First, make sure the USB stick that came with your kit is connected to your PC. Second, make sure the USB cable is also connected to your PC. And third, make sure the emergency stop button has been released on the top of your control box. This just minimizes any communication issues between your control box and your PC. Now, when you plug the USB stick in, you should have something pop up that looks like this. If you cannot see this, you can always head to your My PC and come down to the USB USB drive and open it up and you can see all the files. Now there are a few reference files in here, but the folder we're interested in is the machine driver. So we're going to double click into that. We can see we have options for Mac or Windows. I'm going to be installing the, on this on the Windows today. So we're going to double click this installer. Now when you double click into this, you will get a security message that pops up. Just click yes and continue through it. Now once this screen appears, what you want to do is simply click install and let the process run. And then we get the driver install success. It can take a couple of seconds for this to run through and simply then click OK. Now, if for any reason this screen didn't load up or you was having issues opening the installer file, you can head over to my.yourahome.com, go onto their support page, come all the way down to where it says manuals, go into manuals and then download the relevant drivers here and install from this position. As I say, the files on the USB stick should work, but this is just a backup in case they do not. So now we know everything has installed, we're going to click X and close this down. Now we're going to do a test to make sure it has actually installed and that everything is communicating. Click your Windows button and then start to type device manager. Click into device manager and then come down to the option that says ports common LPT. Expand this out and you should see an option that looks very similar to the file that we've just installed. So CH340, if I drag this to the side, there we have CH34X. So this is basically the port that it is communicating through to the PC. Make a note of this number next to it because that will come in useful in a second. Next, we're going to use something which is called control software and this basically allows your 
PC to jog the machine about, run jobs, that type of thing. If you're not familiar with the different types of software for CNC, check out the link in the corner to my beginner's guide and it runs through all the basics of different software types to operate your CNC machine. So what we're going to do now is head over to our internet browser in Chrome and simply search UGS. This stands for Universal G Code Sender. The first option that comes up will be the main page and then go, go to the download option. From here, you can navigate through to the version that you need and select the option that works best for you. You'll have a screen pop up something similar to this and it will start the download file process. It is a zip file and it will go into your downloads folder by default. We can see it's downloading here at the moment, so I'll give it a minute and skip forward till this is fully completed. So with the file downloaded, you can then open up your downloads folder and you will have the zip file in place. Right click on this and come down to either extract here or extract files. Navigate to where you want it to be saved. In this scenario, I'm going to put it in my documents folder. Click OK and let the process run. Now, once that's completed, I'll head over to my documents and we should see the UGS folder. So I'll go into that. Now the file that we're after is in the bin folder. You have the normal version or the 64-bit version. If you're unsure what machine you are running, then just go with the standard version. And for ease, you can always drag this down to your start menu or your taskbar at the bottom, like I've got down here. So we'll open this up. Now when it opens up, it can look a little bit busy. We've got a lot going on, but it gives you the introduction to the software. You can obviously have a read through this if you are new to it, but we, you can also close it down and you can also move these panels around if you want things to display differently, put them in one together. So I've just moved my panels around to how I like it. I've got some of my key buttons and features that I can see easily. My visualizer, which is where we'll display a job and the console area. And this is basically where the machine is talking to your PC back and forth. Now, the first thing we obviously want to do is make sure that everything is connected up and talking to each other. Now, at the top here, we have the connection panel within UGS. Basically, what this is, is talking about the language that it's communicating in, which is Gerbil. Then we have the COM port that it needs to connect to. If you remember, we made a note of COM6 early. It has already selected this, but if you can't see, what you can do is click the refresh panel and it will give you an option of all the COM ports available. Select the one you need. Now, the board rate is 115200. It should load this as standard, but if you see any other number, then make sure you select 115200. Now, at this point, it doesn't matter whether your control box is actually turned on or not, it will still connect so we can come over to this little plug symbol here click it and we can now see that everything has come to life and it is connected. You will get this alarm message. This is a safety feature because the silverback has limit switches. It kicks in the alarm straight away to say that it is trying to detect limit switches. So all we do is click unlock and then everything comes to life with the jog control as well. Now, if you haven't done so already at this stage, turn the power on to your machine. You may just hear the fans kicking in the background off the machine there, but what we can now do is start to move things about. Obviously, this is fairly self-explanatory in the jog panel. The step size is between the X and Y. This is basically how far you want it to move. So in millimeters, we'll put something like 10 millimeters, and we'll also do the same on the Z axis as well. So we'll put 10 millimeters in there. Now it's got a feed rate of 3000. I'm just gonna bring this down a little bit to something more sensible for a beginner's level. So we'll put this at maybe 50. 1500. Now what this basically means is every time we click one of these arrow buttons or the Z up, Z down, it's going to move obviously 10 millimeters or right at 15 millimeters per minute. Obviously the X and Y axis will refer to the step size here and the Z axis going up and down will refer to the Z step sizes here. So at this stage, just literally go around and move every button and make sure the machine is running as expected. Now at this stage, I'd potentially suggest just taking these values up and just running the machine around edge to edge and making sure everything runs as it should. I'm not gonna do it in this video now because obviously it will take too long, but that is what I would suggest doing before moving on to your first project. We're going to use one of the standard V bits that comes with the machine itself. So insert this underneath the collet into the collet insert. Use your fingers to tighten the nut up till it starts to pinch the bit and then use the spanner to make sure everything is tight and that it's holding the bit. Clamp a scrap piece of material down to your bed. It can help to lift this up with another packer underneath just to give it the extra height needed to reach the spindle. 
and then use the jog controls within UGS to navigate towards the bottom left hand corner of the material that you have just clamped down. You want the bit to be about 25 millimeters higher than the material. Place the Z probe plate underneath and clip the alligator clip to the bit itself. You should make sure the probe is resting flat and not wobbling on the edge of the surface. So now we are back in UGS. What we want to do is tell the machine and UGS that this current position of the spindle is where we want the job to actually start from. So what we're going to do is click reset zero and it tells it that this position in all three axes, the X, the Y and the Z is the start position for the job. Now we know that the bit is higher than it needs to be that's because we need to use the z probe to get the correct height for the starting position of the material so in order to do that we will come up to window and we will come down to plugins and we will open the probe module so it loads in a new tab for us. Now we can see on the left hand side down here we have X, Y, Z, X, Y and just the Z. This is only a Z probe so we can ignore the other two options for now. Now the probe plate thickness is 20 millimeters. So this is the standard one for this machine. If you have a set of calipers though, do check yours and make sure the measurement is accurate. The more precise you can be with this down to tenths of a millimeter, the more accurate your probe will ultimately be. Now the probe distance direction is how far this will travel down in order to try and touch or find the probe plate. Now at the moment, this is set to a positive value, 10 millimeters. So this will actually raise the Z axis up instead of taking it down so what we're going to do is make this minus 10 and this will lower the z axis down 10 millimeters until it finds the plate you'll want to keep this value fairly low if it's a bigger number and it misses the plate it may cause damage to your machine so it's best to do it in smaller numbers such as 5 millimeters 10 millimeters and it just is a safety feature to stop you causing more damage now we'll show you these additional settings over here in the settings tab this basically controls the speed that your machine will try and find the Z plate. Now these are fairly conservative numbers because as I say this is about accuracy and not wanting to damage the bit. If you find it goes too slow for you, you can take the speeds up or equally if you want to get it, try and slow it down a bit, you can bring the speeds down. Now back to the Z probe. With everything in place, the everything connected, what we can do now is click the initiate Z probe, watch it come down and touch the plate and reset itself. It will lower the Z probe down once, touch the plate, and then lower it down again at a second speed, even slower to get a more accurate reading. Now what we can do is remove that out of the way. And then back in UGS, we've got this return to zero button. Now we set the zero earlier. What this, what the Z probe has done is reset the Z height to make sure it touches the exact top of the material. So if we click return to zero now, there we can see it is just touching the top of the material perfectly. At this stage, we're going to load in a test job and we're going to click come to the open folder. And I'm just going to open this JD test logo silverback. Now I will put this file in a link in the description area below the video. So do check it out if you want this test file. So with the job loaded in, we can see just an outline of my logo. Now the blue line is basically where it will be machining. If I rotate this round a little bit by clicking and moving the mouse, we can see all of these yellow lines on screen as well. This is the basically the travel path that the machine will do. So it will travel over, go down, do its outline line move or move over to the next position straight back down do another line and so on until it completes the actual job now a few useful things to point out obviously you haven't already realized this yellow cone over here is the position of the spindle the gray cylinder at the bottom is the position we also set the z probe from it also gives you the measurements around the outside as to how big this job is going to be. So if you are loading in a job from someone else, you have an idea of the space you're going to need in order for it to be machined. I should also point out that when we reset the zero, this is referenced in the coordinates down in the bottom left hand corner. You can see they are all set to zero, which is the start position for the job. Make sure your spindle speed is turned all the way up. So with the job loaded in, the zero position set to start the job, the next thing we need to do is simply click play and let the job run. Yeah. 
and we've done it. We've built the Yora Home Silverback. We've done our first test engraving and everything has gone smooth. Now, if you're new to CNC and this is your first machine, I would definitely suggest checking out some of my other beginner's guide videos, such as beginner's guide to software, beginner's guide to CNC bits. It's just gonna give you the information you need to really get the most out of this machine and learn more about things like the terminology. If you wanna get stuck in with designing your own projects, check out the beginner's guide to easel. I'll put a link to that one at the end of the video. Easel is a very simple platform to get started with and allows you to create your own great designs that you can start producing on this machine. Now that is everything for today's episode. I really hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please give it a thumbs up. Please make sure you subscribe. It really helps the channel. Thank you all very much for watching and a final thanks as always goes to my patrons. If you want to get involved with that for early access to videos, one-to-one -one help and also giveaways, then check out the patron links in the description area below. That is everything for today. I'll see you all on the next episode.